Welcome to another service during the summer. Uh, summer services are a bit different than the rest of the year. They're a little more relaxed. They're sometimes a little bit shorter, and our minister is not in the pulpit. I'm Jill Thomas, and I'm uh, chairman of the worship committee, so that's why I'm here. Uh, this week, our service is going to be, our sermon is going to be from Kathy Carter, and I'll introduce her with more information later. Uh, next week, our service will be about the little prince. Bill Ordez is going to talk to us about this book. I'm sure most of you have read it. And uh, he's going to show how it ties into the UU principles. Please know, you are welcome here, regardless of your race, your ethnic background, your gender, your politics. And in, later in the summer, we don't even care if you've got four feet when we have our blessing of the animals. You can have feathers and you'll be welcome. Hi. We find strength in diversity. And just to prove that I believe in this, I have my diversity t-shirt. Now the reason I show you this is because summer can be a little experimental and we're going to have an experimental service. It's going to be called T-Shirt Theology, and we are going to be able to have some of our T-shirts and our members up here telling us why their T-shirt is special to them. There are some rules. You can see me for the rules, but hopefully there'll be enough people that the experiment will work. Uh, there are multiple ways you can join us, and it's always nice to have uh, a service with a lot of people, but if you can't make it, uh, you can live stream us on Facebook. If you're busy on Sunday, you can check out the service later on YouTube. So no matter what medium you use, you are welcome. Uh, when the weather is comfortable, you might take a hike through our great grove. It's home to birds and bugs and deers and foxes and all manner of wildlife. We care deeply about our land. We recognize that this was once the land of the ancestral land of the Peoria people. They were here long before us, from before the Europeans came down the river. We celebrate them for who they are and who they are, who they, who. we celebrate how they were and how they are today. Now is a good time to turn your devices to worship mode otherwise known as silent. And I've always wanted to put a caveat after this statement. I know some of you, us, may have medical devices that you cannot turn to silent. So if something is buzzing, please don't look at them like they've <sighs> committed sacrilege. Because if this goes off, I need to know about it. So I've always wanted to put that caveat after the turn your devices off. Some cannot be turned off. Uh, we've got a number of things here to help make worship meaningful and comfortable. We have hearing assist devices. There's a child safe area back there where kids can actually play on the carpet. Uh, we have fidgets to borrow. We have a scent free area if your nose is a little sensitive. If there's anything else that you can think of that you need that would make your experience with us easier, please let one of the ushers or the greeters know. Now let us begin our worship together by singing the opening hymn, 347, Gather the Spirit. Yeah, thank you.
to invite Jean Jost forward to give us our opening words. Good morning. These are the opening words from A Place of Wholeness by Andrew Paluka. Come into this circle of community. Come into this sacred place. Be not tentative. Bring your whole self. Bring the joy that makes your heart sing. Bring your kindness and your compassion. Bring also your sorrow, your pain. Bring your brokenness and your disappointments. Spirit of love and mystery, help us to recognize the spark of divine that resides within each of us. May we know the joy of wholeness. May we know the joy of being together. Thank you, Jean. And now Joe Lakota will come up and light our chalice, please. Beacon of Freedom by Tracy Johnson. We kindle our chalice flame this morning, awakening the fire of our ancestors in our hearts. Beacon of freedom held out to light the way, light of reason illuminating the path. Spark of courage igniting our spirits. A glow with hope for all we endeavor to do together. Holy flame of times past, brighten this present moment. That we may be the love that is the center our center and our foundation, both. Blessed be. Now is the time for one of my favorite parts of the service. It's a ritual we call Candles of Care. We do this each and every Sunday. It is a time when you can come forward and light a candle. You may light a candle for any reason, for hope, for despair, for joy, for concern, for celebration, for gratitude. A candle can be lit for whatever is on your heart. Kathy will play some music for meditation, and you're welcome to come up and light your candle.
the flock notes uh, information from uh, the Jones family. And I've been asked to share that they're asking for continued support. She has a family member who's in crisis. And, uh, but that member is doing much better. And she said she appreciates all the support she's gotten. And she loves her UU family. I'd also like to say we're glad to hear Gary Hall. He's recovering from a kidney stone. Now this next fact shouldn't surprise anybody. The stone was harder than his head. That's hard. <laughs> uh, within our wider world, I'd like to share um, some, I wish I had the pictures that I could share with you, but I got some pictures from my family this week. And they live along the uh, Missouri River. And they took three pictures of the river, and you can see it rising. It's, in the past, it's really devastated the area. Um, and I share this because we, we hope that our politicians will take climate change seriously and demonstrate their concern by taking some action. As we share the joys and milestones in our life, may we grow as a community in strength and love. May we now have a moment of silence to mark those thoughts and concerns that are in our hearts but remain unspoken. Summer here at the UU Church brings some adventures for the kids. Religious education will be presented in a one-room schoolhouse setting, and each week they'll explore UU faith through play and curiosity. Right now is the time that we sing our children on their way to RE, where they'll have lots of fun activities without even realizing it, they'll be learning. Our Sunday collection began a custom called Share the Plate. It's a custom practiced by many UU churches. Our Share the Plate program allows for one third of the cash offering from our Sunday collection to go to a charity that has values similar to ours. This month, the charity that's been selected is Look, It's My Book. This organization was started in 2008 with an alarming fact. Peoria public school system, their children are not reading at grade level. Its proposed solution, give books to the children to read and keep. Look, it's my book founder, Janet Roth, and her team of dedicated volunteers, she's got up to 500 now, have distributed more than 300,000 books to children all across the Peoria public schools from kindergarten through fourth grade. They believe when children are given the choice to pick out their own book, they will be more engaged and willing to read more often. For our offertory today, you can put a check or cash in the plate, or you can put your donation in an envelope and indicate if it's for a pledge, a split with the charity, or should go all to the church. Will the other ushers please come forward and collect the offertory?
Thank you, Nancy and Shirley, for stepping in and being our ushers this morning. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Kathy Carter. I've done this a couple times. I've introduced her because I love to hear her talk. She is the official church historian. Last year, she told us about two of our more prominent ministers, B.J. Carpenter and Clinton Lee Scott. Today, she will be sharing her knowledge about the Sunday evening services and lectures that brought nationally and internationally known speakers to Peoria. I have personally requested this. I've heard for years how we had this service and that even Clarence Darrow was here, not to steal her thing. <laughs> but I am really looking forward to this service, so please help me welcome Kathy. Good morning. What do you do in your free time? In today's world, we have so many options that technology has brought us. Movies and TV shows, streaming networks, video games, podcasts, chat groups. You can probably think of many other examples. Now imagine you're living in Peoria in 1910. There were no computers, no internet, no movie theaters, no TVs, not even radios. How would you spend your time back in those days? Well, of course, you could read books, magazines, and newspapers. You could get together with family and friends for meals, sing-alongs, and games like charades. You could go to sporting events like horse racing and auto racing at the site that is now Peoria Stadium. You could attend performances at, at the Grand Opera House, a vaudeville theater that opened in 1891 and hosted some of the biggest acts in the country. And you could go to the Sunday evening lectures at the First Universalist Church of Peoria, the ancestor of the church we have today. The Sunday evening lectures started in 1910 and continued for over 25 years. At their height, they were among the biggest draws in the Peoria community, with speakers from all across the country and the world. Today, I'll explain how the Sunday evening lectures came about, give examples of who spoke and what they talked about, and reflect on how the lectures benefited our church and the larger community. In the early 1900s, the First Universalist Church of Peoria was going through a couple of major changes. One had to do with finding a new location and the other with transitions in ministry. The congregation's previous home on Main Street had been called the largest and most expensive church building in the city. But in the 1890s, because of membership losses and financial problems, the building became too costly to maintain. It was sold in 1899. The congregation then rented a room at the women's club while deciding where to go next. They bought a lot on Hamilton Boulevard and built a much smaller church than the one on Main Street. The new church was dedicated in 1902. Today, we call it the Little Gothic Church. Meanwhile, just before the Main Street Church was sold, the church's minister, Reverend McAlpine, had resigned. He was followed by Reverend Fisher, who served from 1900 until the end of 1906. In January 1907, the congregation called Reverend Dr. B.G. Carpenter as their new minister. Carpenter was a dynamic speaker and a zealous evangelizer. He was determined to make the church grow. By early 1910, membership had already increased so much that the little Gothic church had become overcrowded. The church board was already talking about building a new, larger church and the discussion continued through the spring of 1910. Somewhere around that time, Dr. Carpenter decided to give a series of talks on the subject, The Prophets of Freedom. That's P 
profits, P R O P H E T S, not financial profits. <laughs> he gave these talks on several Sunday evenings in a row. There had not been any Sunday evening gatherings for the past several years, except for youth group meetings. So this was a new addition to the church's offerings. We don't know exactly why Carpenter decided to give these talks, but it does seem to fit his mission of providing more reasons for people to come to the Universalist Church. And they did. The lectures on the prophets of freedom generated a lot of interest, and people asked Dr. Carpenter to continue giving more lectures. The following fall, Carpenter announced that another series of Sunday evening lectures would begin on the 1st of October, but that created a problem for him. The minister now had to write Sunday morning sermons and Sunday evening lectures in addition to all his other responsibilities. So to keep up, he decided to alternate each week between lectures he gave himself and those given by knowledgeable local speakers. Remember, live events were popular at the time, so there were plenty of local speakers around. For example, one Sunday in April 1911, Dr. Carpenter gave a lecture called The Story of Samson. He showed illustrations using a reflectoscope, a device for projecting objects or images onto a screen, kind of the precursor of the slide projector. The next week, Mrs. Frances Schnebley, a local speaker, gave a talk on the development of humor in American literature. An article in the Peoria Star newspaper, gosh, which the Peoria Star newspaper happened to be owned by a member of the Universalist Church, gushed that Mrs. Schnebley is by far the most entertaining lecturer on the local platform at least. But in a year or so, the supply of local speakers ran dry, yet the demand for Sunday evening lectures was still high. It was time to go to the next level. In those days, many well-known speakers traveled across the country giving talks, so the church could draw on this pool of talent to continue and enhance the Sunday evening lectures. In 1912, the church's board of trustees appointed a lectureship committee. By this time, the growing congregation had built and moved into a larger church on Hamilton Boulevard, which some of us remember going to. One of the lecture committee's first tasks was to raise money. They would need to pay speaker's fees and travel expenses, as well as costs such as printing, postage, and folding chairs for additional seating. Most of the financial support came from pledges to a special fund. The plan was also to collect money from the audiences at the lectures. In September 1912, an article in the church newsletter noted that the lecture committee had already arranged for several speakers and had a long list of prospective talent. It continued, from our experience in the past, we are convinced this will be most valuable and successful. We shall use stereopticon lantern and moving picture machines and everything that will contribute to the broader and deeper life. And so the next phase of the Sunday evening lectures began in 1912 and continued through B.G. Carpenter's pastorate. Usually there were six lectures at each fall and six each spring. So who were the speakers who came to Peoria? Well, the committee didn't leave us a complete list of them, but we do know quite a few of them. And I wanna thank Lucy McRae, who years ago researched church documents and compiled a list of lecturers and their topics. So here are some of the most famous and distinguished speakers who came to Peoria in the 1910s and 1920s. As Jill said, one of them was Clarence Darrow. He was a Chicago lawyer and champion of labor, liberalism, and scientific criminology. He spoke in 1915 on the subject Voltaire. 
He also took part in a debate in 1928 with Dr. Thomas V. Smith on the question, can the individual control his conduct? Another speaker was Count Ilya Tolstoy of Russia. He was one of the 13 children of the famous author Leo Tolstoy. Count Ilya Tolstoy spoke in 1918 on the subject, The Tragedy of Russia. Dr. Preston Bradley was a radio preacher and pastor of the People's Church of Chicago. He discussed religion for today in 1924. Jane Addams was the founder of Hull House in Chicago and was described as the leading personality in the world of women at that time. She spoke in 1925 on the subject, Our Relation to Japan. Other speakers in 1925 included Edmund Vance Cook, a leading poet, William J. Durant, a historian and philosopher from New York, who discussed fact and fad in psychoanalysis, Paul Kammerer, a biologist from the University of Vienna, who is described as one of the most remarkable young thinkers of his time in the field of evolution. Norman Angel of London, England, posed the question, will democracy fail as society becomes more complex? Eight years later, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Another lecturer was Lord Bertrand Russell. He was a British philosopher and mathematician, best known for his lectures on social and ethical topics. Most of the lectures, including those by Clarence Darrow and Jane, Jane Addams, were held in the sanctuary of the church on Hamilton Boulevard. Certain speakers, such as Lord Bertrand Russell, were so popular that a downtown hall was rented. And there were still some local speakers. Uh, a lecture by one of them, Dr. Edward Howard Griggs, was delivered in the Orpheum Theater. Toward the end of 1929, B.G. Carpenter left our church to become a minister in California. But the Sunday evening lectures continued under our next minister, Clinton Lee Scott. In 1934, a directory of adult education programs in the United States described the Peoria Lecture Series as follows. 12 Sunday Forums in Winter, financed by subscriptions and offerings. Discussions stress economic and political conditions in the United States and abroad, religion, marriage, and current movements in foreign countries. Publicity through newspapers, outdoor bulletin boards, and direct mailing. Average attendance, 400. Approximate attendance for season, 4,800. According to Clinton Lee Scott, the lectureship had previously focused on literary topics, but under his directions, he said that the lectures, quote, gradually changed to an open forum dealing with current controversial political and social issues. Lecture topics from 1931 through 1935 include race problems and world peace, the ethics of birth control, the German youth movement, some ways of getting out of the depression, Austria's struggle against Hitlerism, democracy versus fascism and communism, and is there a red menace? Not only did the lectures cover controversial issues, but some people in the, com in the community were angered by them. Scott wrote in his memoir, there were super patriots in town who did not approve of some of the speakers booked for the forum. We were warned by an Americanization, Americanization committee that if Sherwood Eddy or Scott Nearing or Anna Louise Strong appeared on our platform, the meeting would be broken up. All three of these speakers did give lectures at the church. 
The publicity for Dr. Scott Nearing's 1930 lecture described him as America's foremost radical. Sherwood Eddy and Anna Louise Strong each gave a lecture in 1933 on Russia and the Soviet Union, respectively. Referring to those who opposed these speakers, Clinton Lee Scott wrote, we found it necessary to place the leaders of the troublemakers under a court restraining order so that the program could proceed as advertised. Another well-known speaker during this decade was W.E.B. Du Bois. The scholar, author, and activist gave a lecture at our church in 1936 about the current war in Ethiopia. That country had recently been invaded by Italian forces led by dictator Benito Mussolini. Despite their focus on political and social issues, the Sunday evening lectures suffered a drop in attendance and collections during the 1930s. Much of this was due to the effects of the depression, which caused financial hard times for the church and the community. The advent of radio probably also played a role by providing alternative sources of information. In early 1937, the Sunday evening lecture series came to a close. There were other lectures at our church in later years, but none as remarkable and long-lasting as the series of Sunday evening lectures during the pastorates of B.G. Carpenter and Clinton Lee Scott. So what was the legacy of the Sunday evening lectures? When the church celebrated its 150th anniversary in 1993, the local newspaper interviewed longtime member Ada Schneider, who was then 95 years old. She reported that her most vivid memories of the church were the Sunday evening lectures. She said, there was no radio or TV then. It gave people something to do on Sunday nights. I went to quite a few of the lectures. They were always interesting. The lectures were designed to appeal not just to Universalist church members, but to the general public. No doubt they helped some of those people become interested in joining the church. As I mentioned earlier, B.G. Carpenter was passionate about getting new members, and he developed a recruitment system for drawing them in. The lectures were just one part of his strategy, but they certainly made a contribution. The results were astounding. When B.G. Carpenter came to Peoria in 1907, the church had 81 members. By the mid-1920s, the First Universalist Church of Peoria had over 800 members and was the largest church in the entire denomination. A 1926 history of the church states, the leading speakers on the American platform, as well as international leaders of thought, are selected to discuss human issues without regard to creed, political party, or nationality. This work has helped to give the church first place in the hearts and minds of many people. The Peoria Lecture Series also became a model for similar programs across the country. In 1916, an article in the church newsletter noted, we have been steadily at work here for a period of seven years, building up this work. And now the same thing is spreading rapidly in the East under the name of the Forum Movement. Thus, we have demonstrated that our work for universal brotherhood really produces results. Another tribute to the Peoria Lecture Series came from the Russell Sage Foundation. This foundation was established by Margaret Olivia Slocum Sage in honor of her late husband for the purpose of improving social and living conditions in the United States. According to a history of our church written by the Works Project Administration, in 1936. The Russell Sage Foundation selected the Sunday evening lecture program of the First Universalist Church of Peoria 
as one of 20 leading adult educational movements in the United States. So you can see that the Sunday evening lectures had a huge impact. They provided the congregation and the local community with programs of education, intellectual stimulation, and entertainment. They helped our church membership grow to become the largest in the denomination. They served as an example for similar movements in other parts of the country, and they were honored as a leading adult educational movement in the United States. The theme of our pledge campaign this year is the church that says yes. The Sunday evening lectures are one of many examples showing how our church has said yes in the past. I hope we'll be inspired by our history to continue saying yes, not just for today, but for tomorrow and all the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Now we can ask if you stand as you're willing or able. We will sing our closing hymn, Wake Now My Senses. Nicholas Hall up to extinguish our chalice for us. So this is the first time I've done this, so hopefully I get this right. Um, uh, together we have enjoyed the warmth and beauty of the stories of this flame and this uh, special community. As our chalice is extinguished this morning, uh, we can still remember that its glow is carried within us, and we can use our inner lights and this flame to kindle new sparks throughout our lives and in the world. Uh, may the spirit of peace and together uh, bless your lives. Thank you.
seekers of inner peace, seekers of the great mystery, lending courage to our future path, exploring science, art, and all creation to distill wisdom into our sacred core, finding community within these walls, using myths as strength to change the world. Our worship has ended. Let our service begin.